I'm uh, Siva Balan. Um, I work at uh, GE Digital and uh, I'm a performance engineer uh, of the security services offered by the Predix uh, platform that's developed in at GE Digital. Um, I'm here to, um, as, as the slide says, uh, talk a little bit about uh, how to do performance engineering and testing of uh, services and apps developed on Cloud Foundry. Um, we, it's, it's basically the practice that we put into place at GE Digital because we develop our services uh, on top of Cloud Foundry. And um, I just uh, thought I would share this with you to see if, if, if it helps even a couple of people. I think, uh, I think I've made my um, uh, goal here. So anyways, um, I'm going to uh, briefly walk you through the agenda. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, why go through the hassle of doing performance engineering or testing in the first place. Um, and uh, we'll look at some tools and techniques that uh, uh, we follow at GE Digital, and I'm sure it's, it's, it's pretty common. We use open uh, source tools, and it's nothing proprietary to us, and, um, you know, and, and anyone can take this up and, and, and start using it. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk briefly about how we do this um, and how we've integrated this performance testing with our CI CD pipeline, and um, how different is doing performance testing on apps that are deployed to Cloud Foundry versus apps that uh, are on-premise or not deployed to cloud, cloud solutions. Um, I've seen some of uh, some customers who are actually um, migrating from on-premise applications to cloud services, and uh, the mindset of doing performance testing or performance engineering on apps deployed on on-premise applications are quite different from, especially when it comes to Cloud Foundry. I'm, I'm not going to talk about other um, uh, offerings, but at least on Cloud Foundry. Uh, because we did go through the process, and uh, we, f we found some interesting uh, findings. So I'm going to talk about those inter interesting findings that we had when uh, moving from uh, on-premise uh, deployments to cloud, uh, cloud phone deployments. Um, just a slide on key takeaways, and um, we'll, we'll start with questions. Um, so why go through the hassle, right? So if, if you've done performance engineering or even, even um, talked to performance engineers, you know that it's very hard to find non-functional issues. It's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not like uh, you run a test and then you find the results right away. So you, typically some, some are, um, it takes a few hours, some takes a few days uh, to find, uh, especially issues like resource uh, leaks, uh, memory leaks, um, uh, and uh, stuff like that. So it, it's it, usually in a software development life cycle, um, in most, most developers or most uh, project, manage, project managers that I've spoken to, uh, it's usually a tick box that you say, a check box that say, okay, I've done my performance testing and it's ready to go into production. It's usually the last step in the process. Um, but it, what, it, what you found is that it's, it makes it very difficult to fix the issues if it's going to be a, your check box for uh, releasing your product into production or, uh, um, uh, or for the customers to uh, consume it. It also helps in catching issues early on in the software development lifecycle. And uh, especially if you're following agile methodology, um, if you start your, uh, at least from our uh, experience, if you, if you start your performance testing in sprint two or sprint three, it really makes a big difference uh, with the amount of time the developers take to fix the issue and the quality of the fix. Uh, let me tell you this, non-functional issues are not, uh, typically it's not fixed the first time. So it, it, it goes to a developer, he fixes it, and then you run the test again, I'm sure you're gonna catch a, a same issue or a similar issue again. So it, it helps to give developers more time to fix the issues and uh, catching it early on and running it as part of a CI CD pipeline really helps in this case. Um, and also, it, uh, I'm not sure how many of you woke up at odd hours to fix issues in production. I've done it, so it, I think it, 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 it really helps in, uh, in, in, in not having to wake up at all hours. Um, so some of the tools and uh, techniques that we've used um, uh, to do performance testing, uh, uh, let me start with, with the type of tests that we do. We start off with uh, initially a capacity test where we take one, we deploy the app or service to one instance of Cloud Foundry, and uh, after, uh, once we deploy it to one instance, we then uh, test it to make sure uh, the service is tuned to um, 
for the, for the most optimal performance in that one instance. For example, let me take a Java application as an example. So if you deploy a Java app to one instance, we tune the heap, we look at the heap, we look at the usage, we look at the garbage collection patterns, um, we increase or decrease the amount of heap or the container size, depending on uh, how, we, how often the garbage collection takes place. Um, so we look at various parameters and tune the application to the most optimal performance for that one instance. And once we nail that down, we then move on to the scalability test. And then we start scaling out the number of instances and we increase the load proportionally. So let's say you start your, your one instance of app uh, is able to handle uh, 1,000 requests per second or per, per minute. And uh, once, and, and that's performing at say 70% utilization with, uh, with a nice graph for your um, um, uh, garbage collection. Now, once you've nailed it down, then you can then move to three instances and you can increase, it, increase your load to 3,000 requests per minute. And you should see a flat line where your throughput increases proportionally to the, uh, the number of instances that you've scaled to. So that's the kind of uh, uh, test that we do in the scalability uh, uh, tests. So we basically increase it to three, five, or 10 instances depending on the requirement of the service. Uh, sorry, the, in the endurance test that we do is essentially to run one instance or maybe three instances or five instances, depending on how you want it to test. It, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, a single instance test or a multi-instance multi -instance test. But we run this typically for uh, five days. Um, so what this catches is typically memory leaks, uh, resource leaks, um, CPU utilization, um, and it tells you if there are objects that are allocated or not uh, uh, removed from the heap. Uh, all those issues are typically caught in, 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 um, in, in endurance tests. And I can't stress the importance of running endurance tests because um, literally every release introduces some bugs that causes memory leaks or resource leaks for you. So um, it, but the fact that you're running in uh, Cloud Foundry, uh, it hides all, all these issues behind the scenes. And I'll show an example of uh, what, exactly what, what this means. Uh, but uh, let's say you have a memory leak in your application um, and it runs in production. It'll run for two days and your container will crash. But uh, your Cloud Foundry is actually helping you to restart the container without even uh, letting you know that there is a crash. And uh, you don't even know, you don't even realize that there is a resource leak in your application. And uh, the only way to determine this is to really run these tests for, tests for a longer period of time, making sure that they are running and you have a nice uh, resource utilization. And I'll show you a brief uh, uh, finding that we had uh, uh, on, on the, on the uh, uh, memory leaks issue. Stress test, um, this is something that we do to make sure how your application recovers after, it, uh, have, after, after we go through a spike. So typically we have spikes uh, early on in the week or uh, sometimes in, uh, early on in the mornings. And uh, auto scaling is not there yet, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, out of the box in Cloud Foundry, unfortunately. So if your application is uh, set to run with three instances, and you're running out of resources with three instances because of a, because of a resource spike. I'm sorry, uh, a spike in the number of requests coming in. Now um, it's it's going to go go down, go down at some point, and you're going to get alerted if there is a, if, if there is a, a, a problem with your application. You're going to go increase the number of uh, instances, and it's going to fix the issue for you. But you want to make sure that, uh, or at least you, you you should be aware how your application is going to recover once the uh, uh, app, uh, once the resource, I mean, the, the requests, uh, number of requests go, goes down. So that helps in stress testing. Uh, chaos monkey testing is something that we have recently introduced. Um, of course, this, is, uh, this came out from the Netflix, uh, uh, as you may, some of you might be aware. Uh, essentially, what we try to do is we randomly uh, uh, try to uh, remove services or uh, instances from Cloud Foundry, it's kind of difficult to um, target a particular instance in Cloud Foundry and, and destroy them. Uh, so what we try to do is we try to scale down uh, when there is a, a, a request spike, and we see how uh, it handles uh, the instances going up and down um, in, 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 in real production. Um, we, we're trying to do this in production. We're not there yet. We're still doing it in performance testing to make sure how the uh, performance test environment to see how this works. But we're getting there slowly. Um, and uh, some of the tools that we use is uh, we use JMeter on Docker for our load testing, and we use New Relic for monitoring. Um, 
Uh, Jalokia for JMX, this is something that I'll talk about as well. Um, unfortunately, because in Cloud Foundry, the, no, the only uh, uh, ports that are exposed are HTTP ports, um, you can't really use traditional JMX tools for you to uh, look at uh, the, uh, the uh, JMX metrics, like JConsole, for example. So uh, Jalokia gives you, it's an open source tool that gives you an HTTP wrapper on top of JMX, and so that it, it's very, it, you, can, you can use a curl request to get uh, uh, output of uh, your JMX. Um, we use ELK for persistence, and I'll talk about this as well. Um, so this gives you a picture of how we uh, typically do our performance testing. So what happens is when a developer checks in a code uh, in, into uh, the developer or the master branch, uh, we have uh, the, the performance test uh, framework checks out the code, it builds the code, pushes the code to the performance test environment in Cloud Foundry. And once that's done, then we have a job that kicks off uh, uh, it's a Docker container, one or many Docker containers, depending on how many instances of JMeter you want to run, and these start pushing load to uh, Cloud Foundry. So once that uh, uh, the load testing starts, we then have um, every app that gets pushed into Cloud Foundry is always bound to New Relic uh, for monitoring purposes, because or else without it, we're just flying blind. Um, and we also have uh, Jalokia which, uh, so for the way we use Jalokia is that, as I said, it's an HTTP wrapper over JMX, and uh, uh, we actually call this using Logstash. So Logstash um, keeps pulling every 30 seconds for, uh, into, into the apps in Cloud Foundry and gets the metrics and persists that in Elasticsearch, as you can see, uh, the, the what, uh, why was, sorry. This was a, this was a uh, picture I was gonna show. Um, so as you see, the Jalokia, uh, versus the results in the Elasticsearch as well. And the results of JMeter also goes through RabbitMQ, and that gets persisted in Elasticsearch as well. So Logstash, so essentially RabbitMQ is a subscriber for, uh, I'm sorry, the, Elast uh, the Logstash is a subscriber uh, for RabbitMQ, and uh, the publisher is actually the JMeter. So the results of JMeter goes to RabbitMQ, and uh, RabbitMQ is a messaging bus that we use uh, so that it can handle multiple uh, test runs at the same time. And of course, New Relic is constantly monitoring your, uh, your uh, uh, Cloud Foundry deployments. Uh, uh, so typically, we run these tests, uh, capacity tests on a daily basis, um, and uh, the results are persisted. And uh, a typical graph looks like this in our case. So this is a dashboard that we built uh, using Kibana. And as you can see, the first two boxes, the transaction um, response time, the transaction throughput, uh, come from JMeter. And uh, all the other boxes, as you can see, uh, like the memory used, uh, file descriptors, all these are JMX metrics that are collected using Jalokia and persisted in Elasticsearch. So we are now able to combine, combine both uh, the results of JMeter, the results of Jalokia into one, one graph, and you can, you, can, you can show this. And it's uh, because it, uh, it, you have the capability to uh, uh, get the JMX metrics, you can um, uh, you can even have custom JMX metrics uh, published into this dashboard as well. Uh, it's, it's again, it again uses uh, Logstash, Kibana, Elasticsearch, it's all open source and uh, it's nothing proprietary about what we do here. Um, and the CI CD integration is something that uh, uh, we take it very seriously. So what we, the way we do that is um, we start with Jenkins, we use Jenkins for our CI and uh, uh, the way we have deployed our uh, perform performance, or we have integrated performance testing with uh, CI, CI, CD pipeline is that um, every time, so of course Jenkins uses, uh, it, Jenkins gets the build from GitHub, it builds it, pushes it to our uh, develop branch. And the develop branch is always uh, uh, the most current branch that we test on. So that's where we get the, the latest bits from. And uh, we have Jenkins, uh, each of the Jenkins slaves is deployed, is, uh, is ha has Docker installed in it. So every time uh, we want to kick off a test, it, it, we, we have a nightly test uh, for performance testing because performance tests usually uh, typically takes two to three hours to uh, run. So you don't want to do this for every check-in on a daily basis. So we do it as a nightly run. So what happens is whatever the last build for the day is, we check that out, we build it, uh, push it out to the performance test environment, and uh, we run the test for at least three hours. Um, um, so, 
and the results of those tests uh, get persisted in uh, the Elasticsearch. And of course, Neuralink monitors the test as well. Um, we also uh, have alerts set up in Neuralink. So if there is an SLA breach in any of the test runs, we get notified um, uh, on the, uh, uh, from Neuralink. And what we also do is uh, the reports are emailed um, uh, on a daily basis or even weekly basis to all the stakeholders. So that way we make sure that everybody is aware of what the performance test runs are, what the results are, and if there is any regression in performance between uh, on a day-to-day -day basis or even from build. Uh, we don't have it from build to build because we don't run it for every build, but at least on a day-to-day -day basis uh, where they, the developers are aware of it. Um, so. That's how we have it uh, built as part of our Jenkins uh, 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 continuous integration. Now, how different is troubleshooting in, um, uh, in Cloud Foundry? Uh, at least because we, were, we moved our application from uh, on-premise to Cloud Foundry, we were able to get some um, uh, information on how the troubleshooting is different from these two environments. Um, as I was mentioning, there is no access to RMI ports um, in in Cloud Foundry, unfortunately. So we had to come up with a way uh, to do that, and, the, and that's, when, that's how we uh, uh, started using Jalokia. So Jalokia gives you uh, an HTTP wrapper for JMX, and uh, you, can, you, you can do all JMX operations uh, uh, using, this, using, using Jalokia, and this, this has helped us tremendously to collect JMX metrics. Uh, some are, uh, most of them are available by default, in, uh, in Neuralink, but uh, in some cases, like for example, DB connection pools um, uh, and uh, other custom JMX metrics are not available, and you have to use uh, uh, Jalokia for that to, uh, to get those values. And of course, as I said before, we persist those in, our, in Elasticsearch, and we're able to visualize them. Um, JVM crashes. So if there is a JVM crash due to out of memory, for example, it crashes the container. So you can go back, if it's an on-prem machine, you can go back and look at your uh, uh, HS error pit file. If you're aware of that, it, it usually creates some uh, 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 stack trace for you. So you can look at the stack trace to figure out what caused your memory leak, or memory, um, uh, what caused your uh, JVM to crash. But unfortunately, in this case, because you use ephemeral uh, containers, you can go back and figure out what is causing the cra crash for you. So you rely on application logs that are, the, what we do is our application logs are all persisted to Elasticsearch as, as well. So you have to rely on a, uh, the application logs. Our uh, CF CLI gives you the CF events command. I'll show you how that works as well, um, you know, how we use that uh, as well. So, um, and, and those are a couple of ways that we've used to uh, see how we can um, uh, detect what happened with, with, with a crash, for example. Um, again, traditional tools like JVisual VM or JProfiler don't work on Cloud Foundry, and uh, we have to rely on uh, APM tools like New Relic or uh, AppDynamics uh, to uh, monitor application during a performance test runs, or even in production, for example. Uh, we have to use these tools on production as well uh, to, to give you a good insight on what's happening with your application, how the resources are being used, um, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and it's, it's, there are ways around it, and it's not, it is not easy, but it, it really works. If you, over the past couple of years, we've kind of figured out the way how to uh, 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 make life, make our life easier um, with, with using these tools. So uh, I'll just talk about an interesting finding that we had uh, with, uh, uh, as we, because as we moved from on-prem to uh, Cloud Foundry uh, deployments, one of the things we found was that, um, uh, so we, we, were, we are pretty much most of our apps are Java applications. So one of our uh, app is a Java Spring Boot app. And um, when we deployed the Spring Boot app, and, 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 the, and of course we, we have performance testing that, that we do on a daily basis. And uh, as, as we started doing our performance testing, we found that the container would start crashing in a couple of hours. Um, you would see that it, there's always restarts that are happening. And uh, we checked our code up and down everywhere, every bit of code, and, and we didn't find any leaks in the code. It, it worked fine. It, if, you do that, if you do the same testing on an on-prem machine, it'll work fine. We deployed on our laptops, do the testing, no, no, no leaks. It, it worked perfectly fine. So the leak happened only after we deployed it to Cloud Foundry. So um, as we were looking through the JMX uh, graphs and uh, the Neuralic graphs, one of the things we found was from the start, 
from the time we deployed the app to the time it crashed, there was not a single full, full garbage collection. So that was pretty interesting. So why would it, the garbage collection not kick in, right? So um, that led us to believe that there is something that's crashing the container before the JVM uh, decides to do the first garbage collection. So what we had to do was, uh, well, after a little bit of um, uh, investigation, what we found out was the app that we were testing was slightly heavy on the native memory usage. So what apparently happened was that your garbage, so let me show you, let me go back a little bit and show you a graph of how these things look. So let's, let's come back, okay. So I'm gonna show you a graph that looks normal. So if you look at the heap memory usage on this, you can see a very nice garbage collection happening. This is in the last uh, three hours. So this is actually a test running right now. So in the last three hours, you can see it's, it has done a couple of garbage collections here. Now I'll show you another graph where um, it crashes, oh, not this, uh, where's the other one? Mm, I think I lost the graph here. Anyway, I'll, I'll pull up the graph a little bit later, but uh, I don't want to waste time pulling it. So essentially what will happen is it'll go and you'll, you'll actually not see a garbage collection at all. So when that happens, it actually, um, one of the things we found out was that the, um, we had to adjust the memory profile. So it went <coughs> too bad, let me go back to that. All right, so one of the things we found out was uh, the memory heuristics that was uh, allocated to, uh, the percentage of memory allocated to the heap was uh, pretty much very close to uh, the total size of the container. So I think it's 75% by default or 70% by default. And we were using, uh, and there was only 10% of memory allocated to native, and it would, uh, the native memory was using up uh, a lot more uh, memory than um, what the heap was actually uh, allocated for. So in that case, what was happening was when it reached to a point where it has to do a garbage collection, it, doesn't, it didn't have any more container memory left. So the container was actually running out of memory, not the heap itself. So one of the things we did was we used a memory limit variable, uh, if you're aware of that, and we can actually set that. So for example, if we push our app with two gigabytes of memory, um, uh, it, what, would, what the memory heuristics would do is it'll give, it gives 70% of memory to the heap, and 10% of the native, 10% to metaspace, and, uh, uh, and that's how it divides up the total two gigabytes of memory. Now, by setting this memory limit to say 1.3 gigabyte, I'm saying the memory heuristics to uh, work on this 1.3 gigabytes and not on the entire two gigabytes. So then what happens is that you have a lot less memory allocated to the heap and a lot more memory available for the native memory. So that actually helped us to start seeing those nice garbage collection happening. So once the garbage collection started happening, the, the app just ran fine for more than uh, uh, five days. There was no issue. So as you can see here, um, I'll show you a, a quick, so if you look at, uh, uh, it's not, let me escape out. I want to. Uh, all right, here it is. Okay, so there you can see, you can see on the top all the crashes that has happened because I changed, I removed the memory millimet variable and ran the test for a couple of hours and you can see all the crashes that was happening. And then I reset the memory um, uh, back, memory limit back and you can see the test was, test started to run fine without any issues. So uh, this was one interesting finding that we found because of, uh, um, and we could find this only because we could run, we, we were running the performance test uh, in our CI CD pipeline and we were able to detect it much before uh, we could we deployed this to production and we were able to get the memory limit in place. Um, the other, uh, let me come back to this. Okay, here. So um, one more interesting finding quickly. So we, again, it's a Java Spring Boot app. 
uh, the container would crash after 12 hours. So we ran a test, we were running an endurance test, and after 12 hours, we'd see the container crashes. And uh, the time, we did have full GCs in them, but what, did, what we did find was the time interval between full GC would start going smaller and smaller and smaller, and eventually it'll continuously be doing a full GC. It would never have time to do scam and GCs at all. And this is a typical memory leak, how it looks like. If the Java has a memory leak, this is typically how it would look like. So you would see uh, a continuous pattern of uh, full GCs, and then it'll start getting smaller and smaller and smaller, it'll, and eventually it'll just be doing a full GC. Um, and we didn't, of course, find any code, in, any Java code, uh, any leaks in Java code, but what happened was that when we started looking at the services that we uh, are, that are bound to the application, um, the service that we were using to monitor the, the leaks was actually the culprit of causing the leak itself. <laughs> so when we, un, when we uh, unbound the uh, neural lake agent from the application and ran it, um, luckily we had the JMX metrics collected through uh, Jalokia, and it ran fine for seven days without any problem as soon as we removed this one. So, and then we had to report back to Neuralink to figure out what, why the agent was causing a problem. So there was one particular version of Neuralink that was causing a uh, memory leak. So um, all of these couldn't have been um, identified if, 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 if we weren't running any of those performance tests. So um, some of the key takeaways I would say uh, for running a performance test are you have to start early in your, in your, in your, uh, in your sprints for running performance tests, and you have to go deep. Um, just running one test and, and checking a box is probably not helpful. Um, always use a good monitoring tool. So without that, you're literally flying blind. And um, as far as possible, try to automate your tests with CI and uh, run as many tests as possible. And uh, you have to enable developers, if possible, to run performance tests on their own. Um, which we are trying to uh, uh, in, in G, and then you have to make test results accessible to every developer because they have to look at to see what what their how their code is performing, and that makes a big difference. Uh, so um, that's uh, that's something we've learned as well. So that's it. And I think I have about uh, three minutes for questions. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy. To. Yes, please. Uh, how and where are you running agent runs um, on so. The agent actually uh, runs on the application itself. So it's a POM dependency because it's a Spring, uh, Spring Boot app. So we just uh, have Jalokia in the POM. So as, a, as we deploy the application, it gets uh, 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 included as part of the application. Yes? It's totally dependent on what application you're running. For our application, it was 1.3 gigabytes, yeah. but for your application, it might be much more native heavy, so you may have to reduce it even more. So you have to, so we started off with one gig, we slowly started increasing to 1.3 gig where we found the sweet spot, and we said we'll stick to 1.3 gig. We didn't want to go to 1.5 because we started seeing memory leaks at 1.5. So we scaled back and said 1.3 is, is a good number for us. So yeah, it, it really depends on your application. It, it, I, there is no one magic number. Yes. Sorry, that was. I think he was before. Yeah. Well, um, when you said when you said um, the kind of access to JMX or or both Facebook and Red Team, what about the fake um, port forwarding? The accessing. Oh, we were we are still on DEA. I'm sorry. Okay. So <laughs> uh, we are moving to Diego. But um, I was told we are not going to be given SSH access in production for Diego for security purposes. So I don't think it's going to work even in Diego for us. So. Yes. Oh yeah, for testing, yes, that's possible. Yeah, I think it, it might be enabled. But I think at some point we found that in some cases um, unexpected things happen in production too. So I, I, pretty, I personally wish we, we had SSH access to it. But yeah, I think we'd we'll get it for performance testing. Yes. Okay. And uh, assigning the JVM, the memory settings that were that were used for a one gigabyte container. Okay. Yeah. Um, but do you see any options to improve the the quality of the build pad, especially the the Java build pad memory calculator, in order to prevent? You can go change it yourself. So what we have done is we 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 forked the build pa build pack. At least for performance testing, what I've done is I forked the build pack and I changed the memory heuristic testing the setting in the Open JDK uh, YAML. So you can even do that in the manifest file for for your application. You don't yeah. Need 
Well, there are some things you can do and some things you cannot do there. And I think uh, one of the things, the memory heuristics, is something that we could do it from the manifest file. We had to go change the build pack for it. Not anymore. Oh, maybe it changed. Okay. But that's something different. But for, for developer experience, mm -hmm. do you see any options for, like, like for example, fixing other native memory tools like, like code cache, for example, fixing that and not allowing to breathe ultimately to, to exceeding the, the container memory? But it, uh, I'm not sure if that's a build pack problem. It probably might be something that you have to control on an application side. I'm not sure how how the build pack can uh, build pack basically tells you how much applica how much memory is going to give it to your application. That's pretty much it. It doesn't care about how much native memory your application is using, how much uh, heap memory or so. It doesn't control how much memory your application is using. All it controls is the memory it's going to give to your application to use. Exactly, but the, the, the memory calculator of the build pack. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's correct. Then, yes. Do you see an, an option, for example, like introducing new, new um, flags that are given to the JVM in order to, to limit other memory pools in order to prevent such crash? Um, I believe there is a way to, um, the only way I can think of is for you to come up with your own heuristics numbers. Um, I, I, and because they give us the option to change it. So I think we should just go change it if we feel our application is not performing with the default numbers that are, that are provided as part of the build pack. Uh, I'm not sure if there is any other way, at least I can't think of at this time any other way to uh, make it better. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Any more questions? All right, I think we're out of time. Thank you. Oh yeah, sure. I'm here, you can come and ask me. <laughs>